The best locations in games are full of landmarks, scenic views, houses and shops, twisty passages, and secret chambers, with layers of unique people, items, quest lines, and dialogue that connected to the rest of the game. It'd save a lot of dev time if we could reuse it. Just make a player backtrack through town again. And again. No one will mind, right? Careful. You might be about to make a terrible mistake. Shoving in mindless backtracking can bore your players until they have died. From boredom. The threat is real. Great locations can decay. Just because an area was great to visit the first time through, doesn't mean it's as good on the 2nd, 5th, or 20th run. You can make backtracking work, it'll just take some planning. Let's retrace our steps and figure out how to make backtracking fun. Okay, I figured out the perfect ad segue for this video. I'm gonna backtrack to last month's sponsor. Are you too busy for HelloFresh? That's fine, I've got something even faster. Today's hot new sponsor is Factor. Factor's the same company as HelloFresh, but with Factor, they've done most of the cooking for you. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals directly to your home. Actual for real good ones. All you have to do is take two minutes to heat them up. You can do that. Bam. Easy. If you're an office type, you're gonna get some gel stares from the weird, boring sandwich guy at work when you pull out your steak and asparagus lunch. They've got over 34 meals to choose from this autumn, with premium ingredients. Broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, asparagus. We're talking premium sides to go with premium proteins. Shrimp and salmon, roast chicken and steak. It's been so nice to go from being neck deep in video edits to just heating up something right from the fridge and having an actual good lunch ready in literally two minutes. Don't be the weird boring sandwich guy. Try out Factor. Head to factor75.com or click the link below to use the code designdoc50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. That's factor75.com and use code designdoc50. Thanks, Factor. So why is the idea of backtracking so negative anyway? I think a lot of it is an issue of perception. For most people, when you say backtracking, they might think of things like being sent on a fetch quest to get something in a town from three chapters ago. You're passing through screen after screen, talking to no one, seeing places you've already seen, hitting X to grab a thing, and then walking all the way back. Backtracking on its surface sounds like a problem of geography, but really it's more of a problem of quest design. Being sent on a long fetch quest without anything new along the way is the problem, not the fact that you've already been in that town. The backtracking that is blatant enough to be stuck with that label most likely has a problem with the underlying things the game is asking you to do. How about we start with the most common type? Really bad fetch quests. Dull fetch quests can add a touch of backtracking to even the best story-driven games. Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is an amazing game, but its biggest problem is how it handles backtracking. Over half of its chapters involve players running sprints between key locations without adding things in between the endpoints. Some NPC will tell you to go somewhere to do a thing. So you go somewhere, do a thing, then retrace your steps to where you came from. Talk to the same NPC to progress the story, and then retrace your steps again for the next bit. Most of the level design in Thousand Year Door is linear hallways peppered with respawning and hard to avoid enemies. As you run errands, the things you run into lose their novelty and they degrade. The repeated trash mob fights go from being breaks in the action, to being the things keeping you away from the next chunk of action. Chapters 2, 4, and 5 are all very, very guilty of this design approach. But the very, very guiltiest of them all is Chapter 7. First, you're told to find two bob -ombs, Gold Bob and General White, so you can gain permission to use a cannon to get to the moon. You know, fun. Gold Bob is right here. Great. Already halfway done. But General White takes you on an infamous goose chase. The hunt for the general makes you go back to almost every major area you visited before in the game, and in each you'll be told that you just missed him, and be told to go to another major area. You do this in Petalburg, then to Keelhaw Key, then to Glitzville, then to Bogley Woods, then to Twilight Town, and then back to where you started in Far Outpost. And it turns out he was sleeping in this house by where you started this whole time. <laughs> isn't that funny? Why aren't you laughing? The framing is meant to be a joke, but it doesn't quite land right. Pointing out annoyances doesn't automatically give a free pass to leave in the annoyances. 
A brisk 25 hour game is better than a 25 hour game with 5 hours of chores mixed in. Some of the worst story driven backtracking can pop up when a game uses missable key items. It's very rare nowadays for this to crop up, but that's a hard fought game design fix. In almost every modern game, if you need a story critical key item, you won't be able to leave the area without grabbing it, or at least you can't get very far without it. Not so with the Sierra Adventure games of the 80s and 90s. They were notorious for having puzzles designed with solutions involving items that could be missed, and you'd have to backtrack to a table or cupboard from way earlier in the game to grab it. Or, at its worst, missing an item that you simply can't go back and get. King's Quest 3. Don't use these coins to buy a drink. You need all of this money hours from now. King's Quest 4. Hope you grab this fish. You can't come back here and you need it hours from now. King's Quest 5. Now Graham, don't you eat this pie. Also, don't feed it to the starving eagle. You need to throw it in the face of a yeti hours from now, or you will lose. Space Quest 2. If you wander into the wrong screen, you get an alien parody scene where a xenomorph kisses you. <laughs> you got me. And back on the adventure you go. Little do you know that you now have 15 in-game minutes to live before a chestburster makes an appearance. Unless you're playing the much better looking remake where they thankfully change it to kill you a lot quicker. They know what they did wrong. Gold Rush. If the RNG doesn't like you, partway through the game you can just die of cholera. Through no fault of your own. You just fall over. I could go on like this. For some reason, Sierra built in a bunch of very slow rolling soft locks. In that case, the backtracking is load an old save. You do have an old save, right? Story-driven backtracking can do a lot more than bad fetch quests and items you forgot about. There are ways to incorporate it in a more natural way. What if the story changes drastically in the same place, depending on when you are? Heck, if it makes sense in the story you're telling, you could pick the times yourself. Radiant Historia is an RPG about traveling between different timelines to set things right and save the world from a slow end. You play a stock who can jump through history thanks to his magic book, The White Chronicle. There are two major timelines you'll need to jump between to find the right path forward and prevent disasters. Radiant Historia isn't so much about carefully making choices as it is about exploring all the different options at your disposal. No matter what you choose, you eventually run into a dead end that requires you to jump to another timeline to do something that will help unblock you in this one, either through new skills, items, or new information. The nature of the game makes you travel through the same points over and over, but the locations aren't going to feel the same depending on when you are. Different NPCs and areas are available or locked away at different times. There will be different types of enemies on each timeline. It's often the same location geometry, but what's stacked on top of it is totally different. Radiant Historia's side quests take full advantage of the timeline structure, where you often get a quest that's literally impossible to do without time hopping. An early one starts when you find a fallen soldier trapped in a cave. You can save him, as long as you head back to an earlier era. You might receive a request in an early chapter to grab an item from a place you won't even visit until much later in the timeline. The game forces you to think on an extra dimension to puzzle your way through the solutions to the problems it gives you, and your familiarity with the locations thanks to all the times you visited them becomes an asset to help you figure out where and when you need to be and makes doing the quests feel different than most JRPGs of this style. It's not perfect. It can get a little annoying to travel to a time and find out you misremembered when a particular NPC was available. And there are some annoying repeated battles. But the timeline structure in the game feels different enough to carry it, even now a decade after its initial release. It leans into its backtracking and gives the world enough layers to make the same locations feel different every time you visit. Not every case of clunky backtracking is done by choice. Sometimes it's born from necessity. It's definitely less work to reuse an old location than to create a whole new one. For a game running behind schedule, it can be a way to cut a few corners. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're going to cut corners though, you at least want to hide the jagged edges. Excessive backtracking can sometimes be a sign of a rushed or troubled development cycle. Retreading the same ground can be thought of as a bit of a shortcut if you need to fill out a game's content with just… something. Devil May Cry 4's campaign is one of the most infamous uses of backtracking as padding. 
After fighting your way through level after level with Nero, some stuff goes down, Nero's taken out of commission, and Control shifts to fan favorite Dante for the second half of the game. He's great to play in this one, with a high skill ceiling and lots of moves to work with, but you aren't going anywhere new with him. His campaign is just another lap in the same areas, but in reverse order. The level designs are a touch different, but you're still fighting the same enemies and the same bosses. It could have been worse without Dante's new moves, but they can only carry this one so far. There are signs throughout the game that there was supposed to be more to the Dante sections, with more unique bosses designed around him specifically. In the series, usually when you beat a boss, the loot is a weapon named after and themed around that boss. Except here. When you defeat Echidna, this plant snake demon that attacks with vines and seeds, you, of course, get a gauntlet weapon called Gilgamesh. When you beat this icy angler fish frog hybrid thing named Bale, you get Pandora. Which is a briefcase. If your game has to make deep content cuts to things as core to the experience as DMC's bosses, then it makes sense that some planned locations might get cut as well, and adding in more backtracking seems like an acceptable idea to just help get the game out the door. Backtracking isn't just an unfortunate side effect to work around though. There are plenty of ways that games can use backtracking to make a game better, or even to make whole new kinds of games. If you want to use it though, you have to fully understand what people don't like about it. Player complaints about backtracking are largely just griping about the game's current actions not being interesting. The general white quest isn't Pedalberg's fault. It's the fault of the feeling of being railroaded, with nothing else to do besides the fetch quest. You can reuse the location all you want, as long as you keep providing something new. If you've designed an area a little too big to see in one visit, a backtracking sequence can be a great excuse to get players to explore it some more. Each area of Bomb Rush Cyberfunk has a lot of optional stuff just off of the beam path. Graffiti, songs, cosmetics for your bikes, boards, and skates, and even additional characters to recruit can pop up in optional parts of the stage after you get through some of the main story sequences. The branches off of the critical path are easy to miss, and backtracking can help spotlight some of that extra optional stuff. At the start of Chapter 4, after you've gone through and competed against other crews for the title of All City King, some stuff goes down and you need a doctor. Time for a bit of a fetch quest. You'll have to go back through several of the major areas you've seen already to find them. It sounds a lot like the Paper Mario quest, but the difference is in the details. In Paper Mario, there's hardly anything new to do in an area after you clear its respective chapter. That's not the case in Bomb Rush. If you hadn't already gone out and wandered the city streets, now's a great time to do that and set the main story aside for a moment to find a cool bike skin or a song. And even if you did all that already, you can blaze through the sequence pretty quick and get back on track in no time. The backtracking quest design is more there to remind you of all the extra stuff you might have missed, rather than tacking something on to pad out the game. You can go overboard, of course. If you take a specifically awful approach to backtracking, you can make a really heinous structure. Donkey Kong 64 set a world record a Guinness World Record, for most collectibles, 3,821 things. Donkey Kong 64 is legendary for the degree at which it uses backtracking. Most collectibles in the game are color-coded, where only one of the five playable Kongs can collect them. Everyone has their own exclusive set of golden bananas, color-coded bananas, banana coins, and special blueprints to collect, among other things but you can still see all the stuff you can't collect yet. Did you see a blue item while you're playing as Tiny? Too bad. You've gotta go back to the special barrel that lets you swap characters, then work your way all the way back to where you were, and grab it. The collectibles don't really do anything special either. You now just have the things. Donkey Kong 64 levels need at least five separate run-throughs to collect everything, and most of it is just taking yet another lap around the level geometry you've already walked to several times before. You can't always even cleanly get through and collect everything on a single run. Sometimes you have to unlock a pathway as one character before you can even get there with another. The levels have a water temple problem as well, where there aren't a lot of great landmarks to orient yourself, so it's very possible to get lost on your way back to find a stray collectible you saw while playing as someone else the game becomes a flood of faded out collectibles that constantly remind you that you've got to come back later. For completionists, it can be hell. For some, it can be trance-like and soothing, I've heard. 
But for me, the extremes that Donkey Kong 64 goes to in its collectible focus backtracking makes the game feel exhausting. Oh, and Banjo-Tooie, same problem, but swap out characters with ridiculous scale. Loot and collectibles are cool and all, but they're a pretty blunt tool. Let's make something a little more subtle, maybe drill down more on making the gameplay of backtracking more interesting. Oh, wait, there's a whole genre in here. Metroidvanias are all about designing backtracking to be an essential part of gameplay. Let's focus on Metroid. At its best, the world in a Metroid game is like one flowing dungeon, divided into interconnected sections and filled with tons of elaborate locks and keys. You explore what's available, stumble into unique roadblocks, and steadily gain new abilities that expand your movement and combat options. Those abilities also let you blast through those roadblocks to open up even more branches of the world to explore, which have their own roadblocks and power-ups, and the cycle repeats. The typical Metroid gameplay loop is built around a semi-linear progression. It wants you to become familiar with the locations of the world and how your abilities can interact with those locations to turn a dead end into a path forward. Sometimes the path is obvious and in front of your face, and sometimes it's 20 rooms back, only accessible when you've learned how to Tony Hawk, er, Tony Chozo your way up there. When you pass by a door or a glyph or something that you know is important but you can't do anything with yet, the game plants a nagging seed in your mind. What's the deal with that thing? What's hiding behind the door? What's gonna be the power-up that gets me in there? That's probably gonna be pretty cool. The game lets these questions hang around for a while without immediately solving them. The open questions stay with you, maybe for hours, as you progress through the game and resolve them one by one. The world is an unfolding puzzle box that you unlock piece by piece, and you have to crisscross all of it to get the job done. That's not to say there aren't backtracking problems in these games. Some are very backloaded. Fusion, Zero Mission, and Other M all have a big endgame item hunt that doesn't take advantage of the structure that backtracking can provide. Most often, they restrict your ability to backtrack for story reasons, or by locking away tons of optional power-ups behind barriers that only come down after you acquire the final piece of your full kit. Zero Mission is easily the worst version of this problem. You get four major power-ups almost at the same time, and all within about 20 minutes before the door holding the final boss. The game wants you to basically do a full lap right before the end to unlock all the doors you've been passing by the whole game. It's too condensed, and jamming it all at the last second is too much all at once. What is there to differentiate all these power-ups if I'm getting them all at the same time? Why do I even need these power-ups if I'm right at the final boss anyway? Getting essentially a skeleton key and doing a lap of the world dampens some of the satisfaction you would get if you were being drip-fed mystery solutions slowly over the hours and backtracking to resolve them one at a time. If you really want players to revisit the same area, you could do the hard work and actually change the area when they see it again. Hollow Knight's Forgotten Crossroad is a hub. You'll be traveling through here a lot as you head to other areas. Throughout the game, there's a looming threat called the Infection this orange goop. The deeper you explore the world, the more enemies and areas you'll see that have it. Some NPCs even succumb to it over time, and become hostile. The full gravity of the infection hits you when the Forgotten Crossroads turn into the Infected Crossroads. The atmosphere is totally changed. Some old routes are blocked off. Once simple enemies are now ramped up to a much greater threat, these quiet caverns you've gone to know are transformed into a late-game challenge. It's great environmental storytelling, elevated by the familiarity you had with the old location. Everything old becomes new again, in the worst way possible for its inhabitants, and the process underscores the threat you've been fighting against. A Metroidvania-like structure isn't the only way to use backtracking in the core of your gameplay loop. Some platformer styles adopt it into their general level design. The later Wario Land games and spiritual successors like Pizza Tower have a sort of out-and-back design goal. You venture through a level, get to the end, trigger a timer, and it's a mad dash to retrace your steps back to the start before the whole level collapses on you. It's the Legends of the Hidden Temple game I've been waiting for. The first run through is a crash course training exercise for the second run through in reverse. Levels can be designed to be harder to go one way than the other. The same geometry can pose different challenges depending on your approach. One way exits, new platforms, and even whole new routes might open up to spice things up a little. 
The timer ticking away ups the pressure even more, turning the platforming challenge into a mix of a speedrun and a pop quiz that you're barely prepared for. It doesn't feel like you're backtracking as much as you're escaping, which makes even the stages with minimal differences on the way back still pretty exciting to go through. If you want something less frantic, games focused on mystery can be great friends with a backtracking heavy design. It's a powerful motivator to retrace your steps, not because the game is letting you do something new, but because you just thought of something. Tunic doesn't explicitly tell you what your new powers can do, or all the things even your basic moveset lets you do in the world. It's all a mystery, wrapped in an instruction book written in a language you don't understand. You can figure it out on your own though, and once you do, there are all kinds of places you can backtrack to to find things hidden just under your nose. Players love feeling like they're the ones who solve the mystery. This style of game is not without risk though. There's no guarantee that every or even most players will be able to work it out themselves, so you have to be careful. But when it hits, it hits. Outer Wilds is a game about figuring out why your sun is exploding every 22 minutes. What a mystery. You have limited time to get anywhere and do anything before that happens, so you need to quickly find out what you need. The nature of the game involves restarting over and over, which means you'll be walking through the same areas a lot. But even though the areas might be the same, you won't be. As you find more clues, you'll start to see the same locations you've been to in a new light. Things that weren't all that important a couple of hours ago all of a sudden become way more intriguing. It's sort of like an intrinsic version of a metroidvania. Instead of extrinsic abilities that give you access to blocked areas, like in Hollow Knight, in Outer Wilds you're gaining access to areas thanks to the knowledge you've gained since the last time you were there. The path was always open, you just had to know how to see it. And once you find one of these, who knows what other paths are lying just under your nose. Better find some more clues. The locations in Outer Wilds aren't full of NPCs changing their story, but that doesn't keep them from changing over time. And there it is, one more video done, and one more milestone reached. I want to thank you all for getting us to 300,000 subscribers. I'm pretty much permanently shocked at how big the channel has grown over the years, and I'm grateful to have you all around to watch it. By the way, we've got our behind the scenes podcast, our newsletter, and some extra perks up now for patrons over our Patreon, so check those out at the link in the description. Backtracking is a structural problem that can pop up almost by default but it's very fixable. Plan out how you're going to freshen up old locations, and you can make the same place work for you for all time.